Welcome once again to GPS, God's Prophetic Surprises, another unconventional format today. As we're dealing with uh, lockdowns and so on right now, we wanted to keep the program coming to you, especially at this time. But I think all of us uh, are needing just a little bit of assurance, just a little bit of understanding, just a little bit of comfort. And so let's start the program and have each of my colleagues uh, introduce themselves and just uh, tell us just a little bit about how you're coping uh, with the current situation. So, Viana. I'm Viana Chambers from the Calamesa Church, and I serve the children in, um, at, at the church, well, everyone, but especially the children. And something that has been meaningful to me during this lockdown has been finding that the families in my community were a lot more connected than I thought. And um, it, it was just such a joy to see them all over social media posting pictures of like the journey of the struggle of doing the homeschools through bonding. But that's kind of what I'm seeing most is that like family bonding. Um, I'm seeing a lot of people on walks. So I'm so encouraged. This has kind of been like a dream of my, like a unicorn dream, right? To see, oh, I wish families would spend more time together. And now here we are. So that's been pretty neat. Mm. Great. That's wonderful. Well, Philip. Good uh, afternoon, evening, or morning, whatever you viewers watch this. We want to just thank you for having us here in, in your home via video. My name is Philip Milo Savlovich, one of the pastors at the Loma Linda University Church. My family has been doing a lot of gardening lately, and it has been rich. My wife uh, literally planted all kinds of things just lately, watermelon, squash, tomatoes, arugula, peppers, I mean, you name it. And, uh, and we built a fence because uh, our little 14-month-old is running like crazy, so we don't want her to go out on the street. Mm -hmm. So that's a big one for us. Awesome. Yeah, my wife's been doing a lot of gardening lately, too. Even brought in a couple loads of uh, manure. <clears throat> and uh, so it's, it's been smelling quite gardeny. Uh, <laughs> anyway, Guillermo. Yes, uh, so I'm Guilherme Borda, and uh, one of the ways uh, I guess I've been coping during this uh, time of pandemic is, um, is family. Um, I think it must be probably hardest for those of us who probably are at home by themselves, right? Uh, but fortunately, I have my wife and my son, uh, so I always have um, a company, and uh, that has been very, very helpful. So I think... Uh, we need to think and pray for those who don't have that opportunity, right? Who are at home, who may be feeling lonely. Um, I think many people have already been feeling lonely for a long time, right? And I think this has just even exacerbated that. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, so just one thing also I wanted to throw out there. Uh, so we may think about those who are maybe going through loneliness. Well, I, I've noticed that uh, one, of the, one of the beautiful things about Zoom is it's, it's a way that you can have an extended family all in the same room together uh, without total chaos. I mean, it, it seems to manage uh, the back and forth uh, better than some, some other venues had been. Well, some of you may be noticing that uh, Shifra is not with us uh, today. Uh, she was planning to be up until uh, just uh, a little while ago. But there's been a death in the family, and uh, the, uh, she is needed uh, there with her family at this time. And we appreciate very much uh, all that she's contributed in other programs, and we'll be seeing her again soon, uh, I believe. But uh, we're here to tackle Revelation 12, and uh, we completed verse 5 in the last program. And let me just review quickly that you have a story going on in chapter 12. It has a woman in distress, a dragon, and a baby. So uh, what could possibly go wrong with a story like that? And uh, we identified these three characters, the woman representing the people of God, uh, the dragon representing the powers of darkness, uh, Satan's kingdom, and the child representing Jesus. So you can see echoes uh, in verses one to five, 
of uh, Jesus as a baby being threatened by Herod, uh, the representative of the Roman Empire, and also by Satan uh, in the temptations uh, and at the cross. And uh, at the end there, in the story, all three characters get together. The dragon is waiting to devour this baby as soon as it's born. And then the baby vanishes, ascends up to heaven. So the big question right now is, what's the dragon and the woman going to do? Where are they going to go from here? And uh, to find that out, we go to verse 6. And I would like, uh, Philip, if you don't mind, to read verses 6 and verses 14 together because they are deliberately parallel in the book of Revelation. All right. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, and here it says, And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. Verse 14. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. All right. So you can see that the two verses are pretty similar and how they function in the chapter is that uh, verse six shows you where the woman goes after the incident with the dragon. She flees out into the wilderness. And then the story leaves the woman there and moves to another place, as we'll see in a moment. And the dragon does not follow her. The dragon follows the baby. And so the story then takes place in heaven for a number of verses. Verse 14 brings us back around to the woman and the story of the woman continues from there. So we'll spend more time uh, with verse six Uh, when we get to uh, verse 14, a little bit uh, later on in this series of programs. But uh, the purpose of the wilderness is to protect the woman uh, at this time. So let's go to verses 7 to 9. And uh, Viana, would you uh, read those for us? Yes, I'm reading from the New Standard Version. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but they were defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. The great dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Oh, the story gets wilder and wilder. I know it's a little disappointment in my colleague's face because... Uh, I was going to ask you a question, and you're just raring to, to answer it, weren't you? Uh, it, it, it mentions a period here, and we'll come back to it later, but it mentions 1,260 days. Yeah. And the question I just wanted to toss out to, uh, to whoever wants to tackle that, what does that have to do with Daniel 7? Because in Daniel 7, you have a period like that. Anyone want to tackle that? Well, the dates we know parallel um, a significant date in 538 A.D. and then another date in 1798 A.D. And we kind of get the understanding of where these dates begin going back to Daniel 7. So if we were to go to Daniel 7, um, I'll have to pull that up really quick. But, so you're, you're saying that, that as you understand the history, that requires the two to be talking about the same thing? Yes. Okay. With, there you have the four beasts and the Ancient of Days, the Son of Man given dominion, and then Daniel's vision is interpreted, and there starts to be this clear picture that emerges and why uh, those dates emerge and, and what happened exactly. All right, guess we'll have to get back to Daniel 7 when we when we come to verse 14. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Uh, Guillermo, you were going to say? One of the things that um, makes one uh, wonder and draws one's attention to Daniel 7 is the fact that in Daniel 7, uh, verse 25, we have the reference of a time, times, and half a time. 
which is um, we also find that in verse uh, in chapter 12 of Revelation in verse 14, right, where we have uh, a time and times and half a time. So that same specific phrase uh, definitely makes one think, hey, should we consider these two together, right? Uh, mm. That's one of the things that would draw the attention of the of the reader or, or the of the interpreter to that passage in Daniel, especially as whenever we are reading Revelation, we should think: Is there anything in the Old Testament that uh, sounds like it? And then you go and then you check it, and then you see if it makes sense to see them together. Oh, I, I like that a lot uh, because you see, if you if you just had verse six to go on here, it's a thousand two hundred and sixty days. And in Revelation, I mean, in Daniel 7, it doesn't say that. It says time, times, and half a time. And you don't even know offhand what that means. You know, mm -hmm. what does time, times, and half a time mean? It could be almost anything, you see. So how do you know that the author of Revelation has Daniel 7 in mind? You know, Philip mm -hmm. suggested, you know, that if, if there seems to be like a common history. We're at a similar point in history, and I think that's true. Uh, we can come back to that uh, at a later time. But in verse 14, the time period's repeated and it uses the exact language of Daniel 7, time, times, and half a time. One of the principles for determining allusions is the more rare a particular phrase or wording is in previous literature, the more likely it is a direct connection. If time, times, and half a time was said a thousand times in the Old Testament, you wouldn't know from that alone what text is referring to. But because it's only in Daniel and only in chapter 7 and verse and chapter 12, two times, you have time, times, and half a time. By mentioning it here uh, in the book of Revelation, I think the author is connecting you without question uh, to Daniel 7 and Daniel 12. Uh, so uh, good job. I think we, we've... Uh, given some indications there of how we want to uh, go about it. I will mention that uh, before we move on, that this time period occurs five times in the book of Revelation, but 1260 days occurs here and also in chapter 11, verse three. Uh, then you have time times and half a time in 1214. And then you have a third period, 42 months. Mm -hmm. That's right. 42 months is in 11.2 and 13.5. So you have the period five times. And the interesting thing is, whenever it's 1260 days, it's about the people of God. Whenever it's 42 months, it's about the enemies. So mm -hmm. in chapter 11.2, the enemies are trampling the temple for 42 months. Mm. In 13.5, the beast is persecuting God's people for 42 months. Here... God's people are fleeing into the wilderness for 1260 days, and the two witnesses uh, testify in sackcloth for 1260 days. So uh, it's just enough of a pattern that there must be something to it. But uh, just calling attention to that, when we get to verse 14, we'll have more to say about uh, these things. But uh, coming back to Viana reading to us about the war in heaven. And... Uh, let me go to verse 7 once again with an NIV, New International Version. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. So what happens to the dragon when the male child is whisked up to heaven? Where does the dragon go? The woman's out in the wilderness. He could chase her. Child goes up to heaven, he could chase him. Clearly, the dragon goes up to heaven because we find him there next. So as the, the story progresses, the dragon follows the male child to heaven. And when we get to heaven, where's the male child? What happened to the male child? Well, in verse 7, we have no explicit reference to a child, right? And uh, that's where uh, comes then the question of who is this, uh, I, I, who is this entity called Michael, 
Mm. But that, um, and uh, here, as in many, 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 many points, may, probably most verses in Revelation, there's no consensus, right? Uh, of course, uh, there are a number of people who will uh, understand this to refer to a very important angel who fights on behalf of Christ, Michael fighting on behalf of Christ against this other angel, a fallen angel, the, 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 the dragon. And uh, but then there's other people who interpret and I personally believe uh, in this position uh, that Michael is Christ. But if Michael is Jesus Christ, the question that arises is, wait, is Jesus an angel or is he divine? And then it creates uh, for some people a conflict here, a tension that may seem problematic. Now, um, a, a, a possible response to this would be that, to try to put it quickly and succinctly, is that in the Old Testament, we have evidence that God can present himself as an angel. Um, and so um, if that's the case, and um, just uh, I don't like to just say it without uh, pointing to any sort of evidence, but if we go to, uh, let's say, Genesis, um, in Genesis 31, for example, uh, Genesis 31, verses 11 to 13, it says, Then the angel of God, this is, is Jacob here, Then the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, and I said, Here I am. He said, Lift up now your eyes and see that all the male goats which are made in your striped, and this is that context that uh, Jacob and, and, and then uh, his father-in-law and the conflict with the, the animals. But then when you go to verse 13, it says, I am the God of Bethel. Mm -hmm. So you have that angel of God speaking to Jacob, and then you have this phrase, I am the God of Bethel, uh, where you anointed a pillar, where you made a vow, to me, and the verse continues. That's just one one of the places, but uh, there's other examples like in Exodus 3, the angel of the Lord appeared to him. This is Moses. And then uh, in verse um, 4, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of the bush. It seems to be here that God is that angel of the Lord. And those are just two instances. I don't want to take too much of the time where it does seem that God is presenting himself to uh, human beings as an angel. And uh, that's uh, one of the responses I would say. It doesn't mean that this is what it is. Michael has to be Jesus because of these verses that I'm pointing to the Old Testament. I'm not com presenting a complete case. All I'm saying is that this just makes it that it is reasonable, a reasonable alternative. It happens to be the one I choose, but... It, there's much more to it. Do you think it's possible that uh, before Jesus became human, he may have manifested uh, before the heavenly hosts as an angel? Is, is that a possibility here? Jesus, the, the interesting thing about Jesus and, and his role in the Trinity, it seems to be that Jesus is the is the person in the Trinity that relates to the creatures sometimes in creaturely form, mm -hmm. uh, right? Uh, Jesus is the one that came in human form to save us. Um, mm -hmm. And there's other texts, and many people will make the case that Jesus is the angel of the Lord, if that's the case. It does seem to be that as uh, in his role of the Trinity, in the Trinity, Jesus is the, is the divine person that sometimes manifests himself in a creaturely appearance. So I think that is uh, indeed possible. Of course, it is something, a discussion that uh, may be quite long, but I do think that this is a possibility. All right. I think Philip has something to share on that. Yeah, I, I think I agree. I agree with Guillermo on that, that Jesus is pointed to in this. And there are two things that kind of come to my mind when we think about this. If we just break down the name Michael itself, Mikael, so El being just a very generic form of the term God, and then Mika, who is like. And so just simply adding those two together, the definition of Michael is who is like God. Mm -hmm. Why would an angel be given a term, a name like this? Who is like God? Could an angel ever be like God? No way. 
the only one who could ever have that reference would be Jesus himself. Who is like God? The Son. The Son is like God. That's the first point that came to my mind. And then there's another one. But if you had something, Guillermo, I see you raising your hand. Just because it is exactly on that. Uh, it's just that some people might come to you and say, yes, but haven't you seen, like in Numbers 13, 13, there is Sether, the son of Michael, and uh, from the tribe of Naphtali. And so... That's true. This you know, is maybe like, more so of a... It may not necessarily be a name that is exclusively sure. applied to this angel. It may be applied to just regular folk sinners, sure. right? So I just wanted to bring that, uh, which good is a point. counter evidence. That's so a good point. Is about God, but many people in the Bible have names about what God is and what God is not. Good point. Good point. And Very I guess I, I use that more so as a, a lower level explanation kind of along the lines, whatever you said, and then adding this in addition to, but the last thing, uh, or wait, did you say something, Dr. Pauline? Sorry. That's okay. Go ahead. Yeah. The last thing would be also that this term Michael is used in Daniel as well, where it uses another term along with it, the Lord of hosts, which was only used for supernatural creatures, some divine like creature. And the only other place that that's found is when it was referring to God himself fighting. Mm -hmm. So certainly, uh, you know, this Michael concept is interesting. I it thought just occurred to me, um, it almost been good if God had called Adam Michael because he was created in the image of God. Mm. And Michael means one who is like God. Mm. So that, that, that could have worked. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Viana, we were talking a little bit about Michael before. Anything you have to add to this? No, I have questions for later on, but please proceed. Okay. Why don't you drop those questions now and then uh, we'll, we'll take them up as we can. Okay. I'm looking at this timeline, right? And um, if I wasn't careful, I could almost see it as like the Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, like the retelling of the same story. Um, but it seems to be this continuous timeline. And I want to go back to the uh, 1,260 days and then the time, times and a half um, that is referred to. And I mean, just in the same chapter, we have the two wordings. Are they the same? Are they different? Um, if we're following the timeline of it, she's in the wilderness being, the woman is in the wilderness for 1,260 days. And then the war breaks out in heaven and, you know, he's cast on earth. He makes war with the woman. And then it mentions time, times, and a half. Again, like, is that a parallel, I mean, a, a literal timeline, which would make mm -hmm. me think that they're two different time periods or are they the same? I'm okay. really confused. Yes, and that, that I think sets the table for, for the larger picture. Uh, let's get to that in just a moment. Uh, but let me, let me just share one thing that for me is helpful on Michael, and then, then we'll come back to the issue of the timeline, because I think you're, you're absolutely right. That's, uh, that's critical to the story here in Chapter 12. So um, you'll notice that uh, I've shared with you whenever a new character appears in the book of Revelation. There's usually a freeze frame. John describes the character visually and then gives a little bit of the backstory and the history. The baby didn't have that. When the baby appears, there's no backstory. There's no physical description. Same thing with Michael. And so I conclude from that that Michael is not given a backstory and a description because he's already appeared in the book already. And as the great leader of the war against the dragon up in heavenly places, he could be, in my view, none other than, than Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, interpreting him as Jesus Christ is a, is a natural uh, from a Christian perspective. But that little piece of evidence, I think, uh, for me, is the clincher uh, to see Michael in that way. The Jews looked at uh, Michael, interestingly, in the Talmud and, and other places where he was kind of the savior of the Jewish people, this chief warrior of sorts. Um, I wonder 
if they would ever even dare uh, put any kind of messianic picture to Michael, mm -hmm. as we've kind of culminated it with it being Jesus itself. Well, what often happens in Judaism uh, of the period just before the New Testament is there were four archangels and seven archangels. Uh, there were different, different accounts. Um, you know, some writings say four, some writings say seven, and each of them had a name. And Michael and Gabriel are two names that uh, Christians would be familiar with, uh, two of the seven. And uh, so there, I think there's Uriel and Raphael, and uh, I'm, I don't have all seven at the top of my, uh, my mind just at the moment. But uh, uh, Gabriel and Michael were two of these archangels in the Jewish tradition. Uh, but uh, the uh, revelation here does, I think, set it up in such a way that this would appear uh, to be Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But that raises the interesting timeline. If the ascension of Jesus in verse 5 leads to verse 7, and then in verse 10 we will see the enthronement of Jesus, uh, just skimming really quickly, uh, Jesus ascends to heaven 40 days after his resurrection. Mm -hmm. And then 50 days after his resurrection, 10 days later, is Pentecost. And there's a lot of reason to see Pentecost behind Revelation 4 and 5, the enthronement of Jesus there. So if verse 10 is the ascension of Jesus, uh, the, the enthronement of Jesus, and verse 5 through 7 shows the ascension of Jesus, then in between must be also within that timeline would be my suggestion. And you will notice that uh, in verse 10, the dragon is thrown down at the time of Jesus' enthronement that is mentioned there. You have the throwing down of the dragon. So we'll have to come back to this in the next program because our time is running short. But there's the question, many have seen verses 7 and 8, as referring to the original battle. And I don't doubt that it echoes that original battle, but in the context of chapter 12, verses 7, 8, and 9 uh, are, are talking about something that happened uh, in relation to Jesus' ascension to heaven, in relation to the cross, uh, et cetera. Where do you see that, Dr. Pauline? How do you see that in there? Explain that to us. Well, we'll get we'll get to the verses in detail when we when we move forward. But but just looking at the top, you have an ascension to heaven. You have the war and the enthronement. Mm. Bang, bang, bang. And you'll notice in chapter five, there's no Satan. Mm. So, unfortunately, our time is up. But it's been good being with you again on GPS, God's prophetic surprises. And uh, we've left a couple things hanging, so you just better come back next week. And we will continue with Revelation 12, uh, beginning with verse 7, on God's prophetic surprises. God bless you.